saved by the crucified one. Amen. Amen. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18. I'm going to share a message entitled The Lost Sheep. And while you're opening your Bible there, I just want to remind you there's some flyers out in the foyer uh, for our Easter musical that we're going to be doing. It'll be on uh, Easter Sunday morning at 1030. And uh, so be sure to use these as an invitation to invite people out. Also, on Saturday mornings, we'll be meeting at 9.30 to go soul winning and um, doing some flyer blitzes and uh, knocking on doors and sharing our uh, faith in Christ, giving people the gospel of Christ. And so these flyers will be uh, passed out and uh, just announcing what's going on on Easter. And so we want you to be a part of that. Also, uh, get signed up for the couples retreat if you've not done so. We still have a few rooms left, not very many, so you won't need to get that taken care of very quickly. Uh, Vacation Bible School will be the week of June the 27th. Mark that on your calendar. We'll be uh, getting sign-ups uh, for workers and all that stuff, teachers and craft and, you know, the whole routine with VBS. And so... Uh, make sure you pray about what you can do and what you're willing to be able to do in VBS uh, week. Also, ministry opportunities in the bulletin. Uh, May the 14th, we're going to do a ladies' tea. Uh, I think we're going to call it Tea for Two for this purpose, uh, that you bring an unsaved person with you. Tea for Two. Uh, we're going to have a brunch at 11 o'clock and then the speaker at 12 o'clock. But bring someone out. Ladies, bring a lady out with you that you know uh, that, that may not be saved. Maybe they've never heard the gospel. Bring them so that they might uh, be able to get under the teaching of the Word of God. And it'll be a great opportunity for you to do that. That's on May the 14th at 11 a.m. And uh, that's uh, a Saturday morning. Amen. All right, Matthew chapter 18 and verse 10, we'll begin reading there. It says, Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them uh, be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more than, uh, I'm sorry, more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones uh, should perish. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for allowing us to be together this morning, be able to study the Word of God. I pray that we might uh, truly be uh, uh, reminded clearly of the necessity to go get that lost sheep. And Lord, I pray that you would impress upon our hearts someone that we can uh, uh, talk to, pray for, witness to, uh, share the scriptures with uh, that might be able to uh, come to know who Christ is. And so, uh, Lord, I pray if there's anyone watching over the live stream or is in the church here personally this morning that's never been saved, I pray that today the Holy Spirit will touch their hearts and they would come to know Christ as their Savior. And beyond that, Lord, I pray for believers that we might be convicted about the necessity of going and finding that lost sheep. And so bless us this morning. Bless the preaching of the Word of God. I ask, ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text verse is verse 11. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. So the lost sheep. This is a great text. Uh, it's a great text in dealing with, uh, very clearly, this matter of finding that sheep that is lost. And I believe every one of us understand the passion of Christ. Uh, the seek the lost, to save men and women, boys and girls, uh, and uh, that they might be able to know their Heavenly Father in heaven. The passion of Christ, the whole purpose of Christ coming into this world were, was for that very reason and that reason only. Yet it seems like, it seems like it's easy for a majority of Christianity to uh, be more concerned and more focused on all kinds of other issues then the main issue of why Jesus came, and that was to come to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. 
And the, on the heart of every Christian ought to be, how can I lead someone to Christ? Who can I speak to? Uh, who is it that, that I can go to and share with them how to be saved? You know, the Pharisees accused Jesus of doing his work in the power of Satan. Uh, they certainly were not connected with the mission and the purpose and the passion of Christ uh, when he came into this world. The disciples uh, who were with Jesus for three years uh, questioned him on rank and position in the kingdom. And, uh, and oftentimes I think we get pretty tight and pretty hard on the disciples because of their actions and reactions to certain situations. Uh, but we're no better than they are. Uh, oftentimes we're more concerned about rank and position in the church than we are, I always call it church politics. I can't deal with church politics. I've watched, I've watched it at conferences. I've watched it at local churches. I, it drives me absolutely up the wall. Uh, there is no ranking in Christianity. Uh, we are on the same playing field. We are all same the same way. We are all gifted by the grace of God to be able to have talents and abilities to do what it is God calls us to do. And so let's not fall into the trap of the disciples of losing focus of why we are here and what is the purpose of our living our life as a Christian, and that is to seek and to save that which is lost. And then the nation of Israel cried out, crucify him. Uh, his, their king, he, they, Jesus came to his own. That was Israel. But his own received him not. And the interesting thing is, is when they, he was falsely accused and interrogated, uh, they would cry out to crucify him. Yet, Jesus affirms the fact in Luke 19.10, I am come to seek and to save that which is lost. And so the lost sheep. Uh, how focused, how tender are you towards this matter of getting people saved. Charles Spurgeon said this. I was going to put it on the screen, but I forgot to put it on there. So Charles Spurgeon said this, God forms man, sin deforms man. The school informs him, but only Christ transforms him. Therefore, preach Christ to all men. Amen. The answer to the problems that we are dealing with in our world, the answer to the problems in homes and families, the answer is Jesus Christ. And the only way they're going to know who Jesus Christ is, is unless somebody tells them who he is. And so God has called us to go and to seek that lost sheep. And Jesus presents this scenario. Uh, if, if who, There's not any shepherd that would have 100 sheep. And 99 of them there, and he have one lost, one strain going astray, that he would not leave the 99 to go get that one person that is lost, or that one sheep that has been going astray. So our passage here records for us Jesus' instruction concerning the passion of his heart. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. So let's uh, look at this. And see this matter of the lost sheep. First of all, we see in verse 11, the commission. Uh, the commission. It says, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. And so, first of all, we see that there is a personal example for us to follow. I have several verses you're going to have to turn to today. I didn't put them on the screen. Luke chapter 4 is one. Luke chapter 4 and verse 18 as Jesus is in the temple, he affirms the fact that he is fulfilling scriptures in their ears. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And it says, it's an amazing statement that Jesus makes. The first uh, statement in reference to the move of the Spirit of God upon him, and the reason for his purpose of being there was that he was to preach the gospel to the poor. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Amen. We have different preachers, different uh, movements in supposed Christianity that say talk about the prosperity gospel. You realize prosperity is not the gospel. Amen. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. 
and yet we, we allow ourselves to be drawn into these concepts and, and that and literally robs us of the focus that should be on the individual who was lost and they need to hear the gospel of Christ that he came into this world, he died, was buried, he rose again, he ascended on high, and he's coming again for us. Amen. And so the commission, here we have a personal example, he goes on, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the broken heart, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Everything in those two verses encompasses the reality that man is in bondage and he has no way out except for Jesus Christ coming and offering himself for mankind that he could be saved. So we have a personal example that Christ was sent by his father uh, anointed by the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel. And that's what we are anointed to do, is to preach the gospel to others. John 20 and 21, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. So we, we don't have the right, nor the privilege, to redefine the commissioning of God in our life. We do not have the right or the privilege to redefine what the Christian life is supposed to be all about. And so there are those that are lost that need to know how to be saved. I preached at a revival meeting down in Delaware this past week. And I know one person that got saved. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, that fellow was fired up and excited that he was saved and going to heaven. And I just know this. There is people that are hurting, people that are questioning what is going on in the world that we live in. And we have the answer. It's Jesus Christ. Don't, don't, don't go off on these tangents with all kinds of other issues and things. Tell them about Jesus Christ. And so uh, we have a personal example in Christ. We see a very practical position. Because it says, for the Son of Man, this is in our text verse, verse 11, is come to save. So a very practical position. Um, I, w I was talking to someone while I was down at the revival meeting, and they were asking me about my, you know, the call of God on my life to preach the gospel. And uh, I told them, I said, really, just basically, I heard, I, I got saved. I was sitting listening to the song, Amazing Grace. And uh, as I was listening to that song, God just broke my heart. All I could see was all my friends that I went to school with, that I went to church with, that I was baptized with in a Baptist church, that none of us were told the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I said, all I could see was all those people dying and going to hell. And I, the thought came to my mind was, why wouldn't anybody tell me? I was 27 years old. I had been in the Marine Corps. I had been a truck driver. Why wouldn't somebody tell me how to be saved? No, they told me what I had to do to be a member of a church. And uh, they, they were more concerned about that than they were concerned about my soul. And so it's a very practical position in that Jesus Christ has come to save. And we are here for that purpose is to save somebody else. Will you be willing to tell somebody how to be saved? In John chapter 3, John chapter 3, verse 19, Jesus said, This is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. And uh, my mother would tell me, You need to go to church, you need to go to church. I wasn't interested in church, I was living in darkness. I didn't want anything to do with church. The only reason why I got under the gospel is because I agreed to go to church so my dad would go to church to be able to satisfy my mom from getting on my back all the time. And my dad heard the gospel and went forward and got saved. Amen. Wow. I heard the gospel and then a few days later I got saved. My wife heard the gospel and she got saved. Amen. My brother got saved. My brother-in-law got saved. I mean, God just started moving just simply because somebody was willing 
to tell us how to be saved. That person you think won't get saved, they'll get saved if you'll tell them. If you'll weep over them, you'll pray, you'll be willing to pour out yourself. I pour, preached a couple of weeks ago on, I'm poured out. You know, Christ was able to deliver us because he poured himself out in sacrifice on the cross. Are we willing to pour ourselves out into the lives of other people so that they might hear the gospel and they might get saved? Very practical position, Matthew 5, 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. You, you can't hide your testimony. Uh, listen, the light of Jesus Christ has shined in you because the light of Christ has shined in you. Then you have, you have the ability, the illumination that can turn somebody else's heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have a practical position. Let's not make it too complicated. I remember years ago, I was talking to someone about witnessing and being a soul winner. And they said, well, I just don't have the gift of gab. And uh, I tell you what, all of us have the gift of gab if it's about something we're really interested in. Uh, we'll talk about sports. We'll talk about trucks. I like talking about trucks. We'll talk about farming. We'll talk about all kinds of things, things that we're interested in. Well, let's get interested in the condition and the soul of an individual. And let's, let's share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we see there's a personal example, that's Christ. There's a practical position if people need to be saved. And then there is a person that is in need. Because he says here, for the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Now we need to see people how they are. They're lost. They're without hope. And we, we want to look at people because we become so politically correct. We want to make sure that we're being positive. Now we don't want to tell somebody they're a wicked sinner on, their, on the way to hell. We don't want to say that. Uh, we might offend them. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I'd rather offend somebody and that got, but got them into heaven Amen. than to not say something to somebody and they die and go to hell. Right. Uh, hell listen, hell's an awful place. And I preach on it every once in a while. I do not like preaching on hell because it's an awful place. I, I Listen, I don't wish hell on the worst person that lives on the face of this earth. Uh, hell's an awful place. So people are in need. In Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul outlines for us uh, the condition of man. In Romans chapter 3, verse 9, says, What then? Are we better than they all? We do realize just because we're saved, we're a born-again child of God, that does not make us better than anybody else. Because at the very best, all you are is a sinner that's saved by the grace of God. Amen. That's it. You're nothing else. And so we don't puff ourselves up, but we see men in their condition that they are lost. So he says this, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. This is Romans 3 and 11. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Oftentimes I've had people say, well, you know, so-and-so, uh, uh, -so, I need to get a different translation because they can't understand the King James Bible. The reason why they can't understand it is because they're not saved. Now let me ask you something. What's so hard about this to understand? As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. Well, I wonder what that means. <laughs> that is a hard verse to figure out. It goes on in verse 11. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Not much leeway for interpretation there. Notice in verse 12. They are all gone out of the way. There's that lost sheep. They've gone astray. They've all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Well, they're a nice person. 
according to the depravity of man who is man who is depraved looking at another man who is depraved this depraved man may be a little bit better than what this depraved man is but they're still on their sin amen they are all gone out of the way. They are become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Verse 13, their throat is an open sepulcher. In other words, the only thing that come out of their mouth, out of their voice, is death. That's it. They can't speak life. Because they're dead in the trespasses of sin. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues, they have... Use deceit. The poison of asp are under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. Boy, I just feel like he's describing America in 2022. Verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Then in verse 23 it says, For all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. A person that is in need. You need to see that person that's in the gas station that's putting a high dollar great gas in your Hey, you need to see them. They are a person that is in need. You go in the grocery store. You need to see them as a person that is in need. And I went to uh, uh, a pharmacy shop, shop right pharmacy last week, uh, last Sunday afternoon. I pick up one of my prescriptions, and I uh, um, thought I don't want to take it, but anyway, I went there. <laughs> And the girl working behind the counter said, she was looking at me, this tie on has all the names of God on it and everything. She said, I love your tie. And I said, great. And I said, my wife gave it to me. And uh, she said, well, I'll tell you, it's just it's an amazing thing. And she said, uh, where do you go to church? I said, I'm at Ocean County Baptist Church. And she said, I used to years ago, when I was a kid, I went to First Baptist Church in Tom's River here. And, uh, and she said this, she said, I got saved when I was over there. And she was all excited about my tie and everything. I told her, I said, well, actually, I'm the pastor of Ocean County Baptist Church. She said, really? I said, yeah. I said, you need, I'd like to invite you out. Why don't you come on out to church sometime? And uh, I said, she said, well, I'm not really worried about being a Baptist or anything. I said, don't you worry. We preach Christ. Amen. And we tell people how to be saved. And I said, you come on over. And I said, uh, it would be exciting to be able to see you come and visit us sometime. Now, now listen, I didn't start that conversation. Oftentimes we think we have to be these great communicators to try to get somebody's attention. I've been in soul winning classes and they said, well, you know, you need to have your warm up conversation. <laughs> And you need to be watching around and see what's going on. You see a lot of toys or bikes. You know there's kids there. So start talking about their kids or their grandkids. And I'm like, why can't, why can't we stop trying to fool people? Why can't we just be honest about who we are? We are a Christian. And because I'm a Christian, I have hope for tomorrow. And I know this, that God loves you. And Jesus Christ came into this world to seek that which is lost. And you're lost without hope. And I have an answer to that uh, hopeless state, and that's Jesus Christ. We need to see people as they are. They're people in need. So we see the commission. We see the commitment back in our text in verse 12. It says, uh, How think ye if a man hath an, a hundred sheep and one of them go, be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine and go and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which has gone astray. I thought it was interesting because he says he goes goeth into the mountains. How does he know he's in the mountains? I don't know. That's the first question that came to my mind. Well, how does he know uh, he went in the mountains? Then I thought, well, maybe Jesus is saying this. He goes in the mountains because 
it presents a scenario that the shepherd is not concerned about the difficulty of the task. He is willing to go into the mountains to find that sheep. And so it is not obstacles, it is not difficulty that will turn him away. If he has to go into the mountains, he's going to go in the mountains, go wherever he has to, to be able to get somebody saved. Now let me ask you something, where are you willing to go to get somebody saved? Are you willing to go in your neighborhood? Are you willing to go to some neighborhoods where you wouldn't feel very comfortable there? You do understand those types of neighborhoods are people whom Jesus died for. Amen. Amen. Are you are you willing to, to to really put your life on the line to be able to reach out to somebody else to lead them to Christ? So I see there was a focus, first of all, there is a focus on the one that is lost. The focus is not on the ninety and nine. And uh and the Lord's really been convicting me about a lot of stuff here in the last month or two. And uh, you know, we have a tendency to focus on everything that needs to be done in the church. In other words, among us, we're the church. We got to try to figure out how to make everybody comfortable and everybody happy and, and all this that, and the other. And what happens, it becomes unbalanced ministry because we forget there's people outside of the church that need Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, I'm going to be announcing next week some different prayer meetings we're going to be having. I'm going to be announcing next week some different soul winning opportunities we're going to be establishing in our church to get back to the main thing being the main thing. I had to preach at a revival meeting and I was blessed to be able to preach. But I tell you, God just spoke to my heart. God convicted me. And I just know this, the focus has to be on the person that is lost. Why? Because Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You and I don't have to worry about building the church. Amen. You and I need to be worried about focusing on the one who is lost. To go bring in that sheep that is lost. And so in John chapter 4, Jesus meets with a Samaritan woman. In John chapter 4, and verse 34, Jesus saith to them, his disciples come back. Uh, they are shocked that he's, first of all, he's talking to this Samaritan woman. The Samaritans and the Jews had nothing to do with each other. Uh, it was inappropriate for a man to be talking to a woman in the middle of the day at the watering hole. And so they come and they question Jesus. And Jesus says this in John chapter 4, and verse 34. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. So the focus is on the individual who is lost, the individual who has a need, and realizing this, uh, everything about the life of Christ was revolving around, in John chapter 4, this one woman who was a Samaritan. And the disciples could not grasp that focus. And we need to be focused on somebody who is lost to lead them to Christ. And then there was a refusal to be content with only those present. And so uh, the, the shepherd sees the 99. Uh, he was not satisfied. He was not content to wait for that and deal with just the 90 and nine. Uh, he had to go get the one that was lost. In John chapter 10, in verse 16, Jesus said this, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, they also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And so the focus is on the one that is lost based on the reality of a refusal to be consumed with the attention of the 99. 
Why, why is that? Because Jesus said there's others that are a part of my fold that are not here that need to be sought after. And there's people, you know, all the time people say, well, no, the church isn't going to grow. You know, the days we're living in, churches are closing their doors and all. I can tell you one thing right now. The focus is not on how we can possibly keep things open and make things function. The focus needs to be on the lost that are on their way to hell, and God will take care of the other issue. Right. What does that involve? It involves commitment. It involves a commitment on your part to talk to someone else, on my part to talk to someone else. I see also that the effort, there was an effort made to find the one that was gone astray. And yes, whatever you're going to do, there has to be an effort. We have this lady's tea coming up. Uh, you know, it's going to take effort. I'm going to stop and think how much effort. Is it going to take for you to talk to somebody who's unsaved and invite them to a ladies' tea? How hard is that? How hard is that for us to talk to somebody who is not in church, someone who's not saved, someone who absolutely doesn't know the scriptures? How hard is it for us to just talk to them and say, I'd like for you to come out to church? I like to share the gospel with you. And listen, you need to come to church. I'll, matter of fact, I'll pick you up and take you to lunch. You're saying, boy, I, now you're getting, you're, you're starting to meddle now. <laughs> it comes down to how much of an effort are we willing to make to lead someone to Christ? I, I was stirred. I was preaching Monday night, and Dr. Uh, Wallace was preaching, he was 92 years old. I remember him preaching at sword conferences years ago. And here he comes, he flew in to preach. And then Thursday he was flying out to go preach at another conference. And I'm like, why am I whining about being tired? <laughs> he flat out wore me out. That man preached on Tuesday night. He preached for a solid hour and a half. He never stopped. And you say, well, I couldn't put up with that. Well, I couldn't either. I was wore out, man. I got back to the motel. I said, I can't take any more preaching right now. I mean to tell you. You say, what does that have to do with anything? It has to do with what kind of effort are you going to put forth? What kind of effort are you going to invest in telling others about Christ? So we go in spite of the excuses. All of us can make all kinds of excuses on why we don't want to go. Well, I'm afraid to talk to people. I don't have enough Bible verses. Do you realize if you know one Bible verse, you know more than the person you're going to talk to who is lost? In Luke chapter 14, uh, Jesus gives this parable of, of man having a supper. He sends them out. And in Luke chapter 14 and verse 18, and they all with one consent began to make excuse. How many people have you invited to church? And they say, well, I really can't go. Well, I have this going on. Oh, my relatives are coming in that weekend. Uh, everybody comes up with all kinds of excuses. So does that, listen, does that cut my commitment down to a point where I can't, I will not talk to somebody? So listen, we go, we put an effort in regardless of the of, uh, excuses that are made. But also we go because there's room. And those in Luke chapter 14, verse 22, and the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. Oh, man, we got plenty of seats up here. Got plenty of seats over there. Got plenty of seats back there. We got seats all the way across the back. There's, still, there's, there's plenty of room. Uh, I, you know, <laughs> I started a church back in 1984, and the janitor was old drunk. And uh, he would, I'd hear him walking down the hallway, and it was, I, there were many times it was just my wife and I at the church service. And uh, he would come walking in, and I'd hear him coming, and I'd just start saying, Hey, folks, come on in. There's plenty of room right down front here. <laughs> we were in an auditorium that seated like 500 people. It was cut in half, so it was about 250 people in sit, sit, seat. And it was my wife and I. I had thought about bringing my dog one Sunday. Just to get the in the tent, I think, but I used to just say, come on down, folks. There's, there's plenty of room. 
hey, we can still say, come on in, folks, there's plenty of room. Amen. So we go, in spite of excuses, we go because there's still room, and we go into every neighborhood and home. In, in Luke chapter 14 and verse uh, 23, and the Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. I think the Lord wants to fill up the church, but it requires the people of God having a commitment to take the gospel to the people so that he might get saved. You say, well, people are not going to go to church. Well, you're right. An unsaved person doesn't want to go to church. So go out and lead them to the Lord. They get saved. I don't know about you, but I got saved. I was excited about being in church. Amen. My wife and I, we got married. We never went anywhere without the other one. And I'll tell you, she wasn't feeling good. She was homesick. And I, I got up in the morning. I got dressed on Sunday morning. She said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to church. She said, I'm sick. I said, I'll be back. <laughs> Now, before I got saved, I didn't want to go to church. But I believe God wanted me out of the house because that morning my wife watched Rex Humbard on uh, television, televangelist. And he said, I know there's somebody in, that's in your living room and you need to be saved. You need to get, on, you know, get off the couch, he said, and get on your knees and ask Jesus to be your Savior. That's what my wife did. She got saved. God, amen. And I'm going to tell you, we, we make this thing too complicated. All we need to do is understand we have been commissioned to tell people how to be saved, and then there needs to be a commitment to following through. Well, notice in verse 13, back in our text, the consolation. Notice in verse 13, it says, And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep then of the ninety and nine which went not astray, the consolation. Notice the efforts paid off because he found it. And uh, listen, there that God will bless us if you put forth the effort. Here's a few verses. I put them on the screen for you. John two twenty three says, "And many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did." And so I people won't get saved. Yeah, well, there's many of them did. Didn't say all of them. It said many of them. Notice in John 8, 30. says, and he spake these words, and many believed on him. John 10, 42. And many believed on him there. John 12, 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him. And Acts chapter 9, and verse 42, it says, and it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. I'm telling you this morning, there is a peace, there is a consolation prize, if you will. And it's a reality that when we put forth the effort, God blesses the effort. But he's not going to bless just sitting around doing nothing. And so I see the effort paid off, and I see the effects were worth it. Because it tells us here that he, there was rejoicing over the sheep that was found. Uh, the efforts were worth it. I don't know about you. I get excited in church when people get saved. I, when people's lives are changed, it stirs me up. Uh, you, you, can't, you can't deny the reality of the effects of people coming to Christ. And the first, first kid I led to the Lord was up at Emmanuel Baptist Church, and I let him a buddy of mine and said, hey, Mike, how about taking this, and I think he was about seven, eight years old, take this young man, he wants to be saved, show him how to be saved. I was a nervous wreck. I never led anybody to the Lord before. And I was like, I thought to myself, I hope I don't do anything wrong when this kid dies without Christ. I mean, the pressure was on me, so I took him over, and I just went through the simple plan of salvation. And I got done leading, going through the plan of salvation. I asked him, I said, you want to ask Christ to be your Savior? And he said, I sure do. And we prayed together and he got saved. And he jumped out of that seat and ran across the back of Emmanuel Baptist Church to his mom crying out, Mommy, 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 that man saved me. <laughs> now let me tell you, I've never got over that. Right. I've never got over that. 
There's people I've led to the Lord in the truck stop. I'm a loner. I don't want to talk to people. I go in and sit down at the counter, figure I can sit at the counter, get something to eat, get out and keep moving. And somebody would come over and sit next to me and start talking. <laughs> well, they said, stop talking to me. I'm a loner. <laughs> I get talking to them and then lead them to the Lord. <clears throat> I, I, I tell you, you have to understand that there is a reward for doing what God has called us to do, and there is rejoicing. So I see the consolation. I've got to hurry up and we'll be done. There's the choice. Notice in verse 14 of our text, Matthew 18, Even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. The choice. First of all, God's will, God's will is that people get saved. I did a double printing there, but anyway. God's will is that people will get saved. Second Peter 3, 9, God is not slack concerning his promises, as some, some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. I can guarantee you this, the only reason why this world is still in existence is because of the long-suffering of God. Amen. It's because of the grace of God. It is because God is not willing that any should perish. So, what about your will? Our, your will enters into this. John 7, 17 says, If any man will do his will, well, we know what his will is. He's not willing that any should perish. So, if any man's will do his will, he shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. And so I need to choose to be in the connection with the reality of God's will. God's will is that he's not willing that any should perish. What right do I have to walk past somebody who's not saved and not at least give them a try? So what's your desire? Jeremiah 24, 7, it says, and I will give them a heart to know me. Oh, Amen. Ooh, I read that verse. It, it, it hit my heart. I will give them a heart to know me for that I am the Lord and they shall be my people and I will be their God and they shall return unto me with their whole heart. Choice. Life is about choices. If I, if I hadn't chosen to go ahead and uh, submit to the nagging of my mother to go to church so my dad could hear the preacher, I doubt if I'd be saved. I was this close to re-enlisting re in the Marine Corps. And there were some things I was putting on the table I expected them to do for me if I re-enlisted. If they did that, if they had done what I was requesting of them, I would have re-enlisted. I often wonder if I would have ever got saved. Because in four years in the Marine Corps, no, not one soul ever told me that I needed to be saved. Choices. Life is about choices. Your choice, are you willing to make your choice to see people saved? Psalm 37 and 4 says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Now, I don't believe that verse is saying, well, if you desire to have a multi-million dollar airplane, God will give that to you. I'm not saying God can't give it to you. But what I see in the scriptures, the will of God that is prominent is that he's not willing that any should perish. And if I want God to fulfill the desires in my heart, then my desires in my heart need to line up with his desires. And if I'm lined up with his desires and with his will, it's a natural way to live. Now what's on my heart, God gives me. And God blesses me. D.L. Moody said this, there is no greater honor than to be the instrument in God's hands 
of leading one person out of the kingdom of Satan into the glorious light of heaven. You realize that this morning? Uh, how many people you went by this morning on your way over here to church? You realize this this morning that every one of those people that you went by that are not saved <coughs> are a part of the kingdom of Satan. <coughs> they are groping in darkness. They are in bondage. They do not know which way to turn and they are without hope. John R. Rice, great old preacher years ago when he started up the Sword of the Lord, he said this, any saint who does not love and seek sinners is without excuse. He is untrue to his Savior, ungrateful for his own salvation, and disobedient to the Great Commission. That's convicting. Somebody asked Dr. Rice years ago, uh, how did you know the will of God, whether God called you in the ministry or not, or called you to be a preacher? How do you know that? And Dr. Rice looked at him and said, I don't have any idea. <coughs> Great evangelist, starting the sword of the Lord, leading hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, even thousands of people to Christ. He says, I don't have any idea. And he said, what do you mean you don't have any idea? He said, I just knew that there was people that were lost, that needed to hear the gospel, and I just volunteered. Said, Lord, if you use me, then I'll do it. He said, I don't, I don't know of any supernatural call of God on my life. I just surrender myself and volunteer. Are you willing this morning to volunteer to go after the lost sheep? You, you do understand that if we don't go after the lost sheep, that we are leaving their soul in a dangerous situation that's going to affect them for all eternity. And it all just comes down to this. Are you willing to tell them about the love of God and the gospel of Christ and why Jesus came into this world and how they can find hope and how they can find deliverance? Just keep it simple. Just tell them about, they don't need to hear eschatology and they don't need to hear soteriology and they don't need to know what all the vials in Revelation is and they don't need to, they don't need to know all that stuff. They just need to hear the gospel of Christ. And so just tell them how to be saved. And so let's pray. I'll keep going if I don't pray. Um, Maybe you're here, maybe you're watching on live stream, and you don't know what it means to be saved. Uh, you really you just, you know, you, you may have heard it, you may have someone talk to you about it, but you've never really been born again. You've never been saved. Uh, I want you to know that God loves you, and Jesus came into this world specifically for you. Maybe you're here this morning, you say, if I die right now, preacher, I do not know 100% sure I would go to heaven. And I need prayer. When you slip up your hand, I'll pray for you. I won't call you out of your seat. I won't embarrass you. You say, I'm just not sure I'm saved. If I die right now, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. And I need prayer. Anyone at all, you slip up your hand. Now, Christians, let's think about the efforts that we have or have not done in just telling people who our Savior is. Maybe here this morning you'd say, Preacher, I just, I just have been negligent on this thing of telling others about Christ. And I need prayer about that. But I would be more discerning and more aware of those that are around me that they need Jesus. And I'm, I really am. I'm just asking for prayer. So that I would make an honest effort just to share the gospel with somebody this week. You slip up your hand. I want to pray for you. God bless you. I see those hands and those hands. Anyone else? You say, I just need prayer. God bless you. I see that hand. We don't have to make it complicated. You just need to just talk to somebody. Give them a track or whatever it is. My God, I come to you. I thank you so much for your grace. I thank you, Lord, for your willingness to save us. I pray if there's anyone watching the live stream that needs to be saved, I pray they would call us. 
we'd be able to take the Bible and show them how to trust Christ. I pray in this invitation of someone here that needs to be saved, that they would come and we would show them how, from the Bible how to be saved. But I pray for believers. Uh, Lord, it's so easy in this world to get distracted, drawn away, turn aside, and yet there's people all around us who need to know the love of God. So help us, Lord. We're just asking you, Lord, humbly, we're asking you. Just graciously, Lord, prod our hearts, impress upon us uh, who it is we need to talk to. And help us to share the gospel of Christ. The lost sheep need to be found. So use us, Lord, to reach out to them. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing a song of invitation. And while we're singing, uh, we invite you to come to the altar. If you're not sure you're saved, I'll meet you down here. We'll take the Bible and show you how to trust Christ as your Savior. As a believer, you need to pray about being a witness to someone else. You need somebody to pray with you. Get the person next to you. Come down. I'll get somebody to pray for you. But realize this. God wants to work through us to get the lost sheep saved. And let, he makes that the priority, so why don't we make it the priority? And you come, maybe you need to be baptized, maybe you need to join the church, you come, and we'll help you with that right down front here, we'll pray with you, you come as we say, pass me not on you, salvation and the joy that we experienced and may that be the driving force Lord that our love for you and your love for others Lord would just be evident in our lives and that Lord we would just desire to see others come to you thank you for the privilege of serving you and Lord thank you that we don't go in our own strength but in the power of the Holy Spirit we thank you for this morning's message we pray that you would bring us back this evening ready to hear from you again Dismiss us now with your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.